Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Brigham. I'm the Chief of Staff and Chief of Education at the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, affectionately known by some of you as the ACGME. And I'd like to welcome you to a really special and extraordinary conversation that you're, you're about to hear. Um, a quick word on why the ACGME is, uh, is really, really, really not just interested in this, but is, um, is bound and determined to get this message across that you're going to hear is because a lot of you would think that the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education's main mission is to accredit. It is not to accredit. Our mission is to use accreditation and education to further the careers of young, extraordinary physicians to serve the health of the public. There is no better example of that than what you're about to hear. This conversation uh, is between and with the two recipients of the 2021 Vilcek Gold Award for Humanism and Healthcare, which was created to recognize and honor immigrant contributions to healthcare in the US. The two recipients of that award, Dr. Jerry Ayut uh, Nu, uh, Lottie Vongskorn, and Dr. Denise Rojas Marquez are extraordinary people who have put dreams into action. The story of their lives in America and their work will be facilitated by another uh, extraordinary physician, Dr. Pedro Joe Greer. Nu and Denise are two young physicians who are exemplars of what's possible when you vision things and when you put them into action. They're the co-founders of Pre-Health Dreamers, a collective organization focused on helping young immigrants pursue higher education and careers in healthcare. Denise, she's an emergency uh, resident physician in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Boston Medical Center. And Nu is a staff physician in family and community medicine at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital and Trauma Center. Our facilitator for this conversation, Joe, is a longtime advocate for health equity. He works directly with patients as well as guiding and advising the nation on policy. He's the founding dean of the College of Medicine at Roseman University Health Sciences, and he is a recipient of both the Presidential Medal of Freedom and a MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant Fellowship. He is also a trustee of the Gold Foundation. Following this discussion, there will be a live question and answer session. Please submit your questions as Sherry indicated during the presentation using the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. Questions entered in the Q&A uh, section will only be visible to the presenter and will be discussed at the end of the presentation. This is an extraordinary moment. Uh, as I was saying earlier to the, to the recipients of the award, in a time when there's lots and lots and lots of bad news and uh, things on social media, there is a measure of hope here. There is something to celebrate. And exemplars of that are the two people that, we are, that, we're, we're, that were honored by the Vilcek uh, Gold Award and Dr. Joe Pedro um, Greer, who's leading the discussion. So let's uh, get ready to hear from them. But first, I'd like to turn it over to my great friend, uh, who is uh, the uh, president and CEO of the Gold Foundation, um, Dr. Richard Levin, and he will be followed by Dr. John Vilcek, John uh, Chairman and CEO of the Vilcek Foundation. So Rich, I turn it over to you, um, and then uh, we will participate in, in something very, very special today. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Tim. Uh, it's a great personal pleasure to join you this afternoon. And as you say, uh, in the midst of the profound uncertainty of this moment, it's just terrific that we can be together here today to celebrate Drs. Lathi Vangskorn and Rojas, who as residents received this prestigious award honoring immigrants' contributions to American medicine. The humanism that Nu and Denise have shown in their advocacy, courage, and care for patients is exactly what the Gold Foundation champions. 
especially in our strongly held belief that compassionate, collaborative, and scientifically excellent care must be accessible to all peoples. We partner with the ACGME in our Bud Baldwin Award, which recognizes institutions that foster a respectful, supportive environment for residency. And we are grateful that the ACGME and the Vilcek Foundation are collaborating with us on this special event. When the Gold Foundation partnered with the Vilcek Foundation to honor immigrants in healthcare, it marked the first time a gold award specifically recognized immigrant leaders and the first time a Vilcek award was particular to healthcare. To have these three organizations collaborating together today with Denise New and Dean Joe Greer has just been uh, wonderful. And now I would like to give the mic uh, to my friend and co-founder of the Vilcek Gold Award, Dr. Jan Vilcek. Thank you, Rich. And thank you, ACGME. I'm happy to be here to help introduce this wonderful discussion. My wife, Maritza, and I established the Vilcek Foundation to acknowledge the enormous contributions immigrants make in the sciences and in the arts in the United States. As you already heard from Rich, we partnered with the Gold Foundation to launch the Vilcek Gold Award for Humanism in Healthcare. The prize honors the missions of both organizations by recognizing immigrant leaders who have had an extraordinary impact on humanism in healthcare in America. Today, we are thrilled to hear from two outstanding young physicians, New and Denise, who received this award jointly in 2021. Now, let's welcome you, Denise and Joe. First and foremost, it, it is truly my honor to even sit in a room like this, or a virtual room, with both of you. Your accomplishments are not only to be applauded and supported, but to bring to light what is really there. You are, in my opinion, the true definition of a physician. You advocate. And that is our lane, by the way. Because if we don't advocate and help people, they end up getting sick. But having said that, New, tell us a little about yourself. I was born in Thailand, uh, and I grew up there, uh, went until the age of nine. And that was when my family and I immigrated to, to America. And we have since been in California ever since. We first started in a, you know, as a family of five, sharing a one bedroom apartment for many years in the San Francisco Bay Area. And my parents found work at Thai restaurants and at waited tables for almost two decades. Throughout those many, many years, you know, I've seen how my parents had to start over with life in a new country, uh, sacrificed and left behind whatever careers they had, whatever they knew to learn a new language, learn a new culture. And even though I, I always think of it as, um, even though we didn't really know all the implications of what moving here as undocumented immigrants, what the implications would be, uh, I always, found it very fortunate that we, we knew that we had to do it as a family and just stick together. And we looked to higher education. You know, we set our sights on that as the goal because we really believe that that's how we would be able to find success here, here in America. That's just a little bit about me and how <laughs> my family story, but then kind of fast forward many years, I'm now finished, uh, uh, residency training in family medicine. Oh, you done? Uh, yes, I, I am completed um, with a family medicine program at UCSF. Um, 
training three years at the public county hospital, the SF General Hospital, and I'm very proud and excited to have completed that uh, that step of my journey. Well, fantastic. Denise, you came here at a much younger age. Tell us your story. Yeah, uh, a little bit younger, but similarly, um, I came with my family in the 90s with my um, older brother, older sister, my mom and my dad, and we settled in California as well. We grew up in Fremont and living with my family, all, all I knew was uh, growing up without immigration status. And that for me had different implications um, at sort of different stages in my life, whether it was at the age of 16, not being able to drive or when I entered college, not being able to obtain financial aid. One of the ways that it hit me the hardest was when my mother was in college and she uh, ne needed surgery and was denied health insurance because of her immigration status and also at the time because of a pre-existing health condition before the full uh, implementation of the Affordable Care Act. That was absolutely heartbreaking for me to realize that being undocumented in the United States could mean that your health and your safety um, was in jeopardy. I felt that my mom could literally die in the United States if, if she didn't leave. And that was so eye-opening for me um, to see my immigration status affect the health of, of my mother. And so she ended up immigrating to Canada with, with my eventually my brother, my um, dad as well. And, and they've been there, they're, they've been there for now over 10 years. Um, and I'm, I'm really grateful that my mom eventually got the surgery that she needed and is um, well and safe. And that for me has been such an inspiration and motivation to be not only a doctor who provides empathetic care to immigrants to underserved communities, but that also has um, the agency to advocate for policies that are progressive for the immigrant community. Because um, it, it's not just enough, like you said, to be a doctor. I mean, I think the full essence of a physician includes speaking up for your patients and, and um, being at decision-making tables where often our our patients aren't invited um, and their opinions aren't, um, you know, they're just not at those tables where a lot of the policy making is being made. And, and so that's why I ended up uh, pursuing both a medical degree. I went to the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, where I was the first undocumented student to attend. Um, and then I also pursued a master's in public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. And now I'm currently a second year emergency medicine resident at Boston Medical Center. My, my almost immigrant story is I was actually born in the United States by accident. My mother was visiting, I was born prematurely. And after the revolution in Cuba, they wouldn't give my family, a, the US would not give my family a visa because wow. we came from a, a very humble background. Actually, my father says we're the only family that lost nothing with Fidel because we had nothing. So. But it was that I was born here. So my daughter refers to me as America's first anchor baby that was able to get the rest of the family here. And I know you guys are stu were students and are residents and now just finishing up. So you didn't have all the time in the world. How did you find the time to do all the things you did? Number one and number two, how did you two meet and start PhD? So Nu and I were finishing up our undergraduate education at UC Berkeley. And at the time I was extremely ashamed of my immigration status and felt fear um, of being caught and detained. And that was something really heavy that I lived with every day and feeling like there was no one around me that I could share the secret with. And I met an organization called Educators for Fair Consideration that's now Immigrants Rising in the San Francisco Bay Area. And they provided a scholarship program to students like me. And I applied. Um, first of all, I couldn't fathom that there was an organization that recognized um, 
folks like myself and that even provided us with financial aid or financial help to be able to pay for college. And so when I was a scholarship recipient, actually it was during the dinner that I met New and uh, one of the other co-founders of Pre-Health Dreamers. And it was just such an amazing and beautiful community to see people not only say that they are undocumented out loud. I mean, I really, for me, that was even something that I was uh, afraid of. Um, but for people to say and, and share their stories of how they are, you know, the term we use is undocumented, unafraid. And to see um, a lot of these scholarship recipients be out there and be, you know, in front of um, marches for the DREAM Act to be in documentaries, you know, it was just changed the way that I thought about myself and my status. And it felt like it's something that I could be proud of and that I could use for change for other people. So that was the environment in which we, I met the other co-founders. You'll hear many other stories. We never envisioned Free Health Dreamers to be an organization or to, you know, have now been in existence for um, a decade. It was it started off as a, as a network. So New um, and Angel Koo, who's the other co-founder, we met at coffee shops and um, you know, just talked about our struggles. And we realized that the three of us had faced the similar challenges and individually had tr um, overcome some of those challenges. And, and, and it was really isolating. And we thought that if we could build a community that shared resources, that shared knowledge, and that maybe it wouldn't be so hard um, for us to try to pursue medical school or graduate programs. So it really started from a concept and, and a small idea. Um, fast forward, uh, you know, one or two years, we had kind of a better sense of the, heart, the, the challenges um, and the tangible issues that were barriers for us to actually matriculate into medical programs, like uh, not being el eligible for licensure at the time. And so it was really amazing for us to then find funders and find allies who believed in a bunch of recent college graduates, you know, for them to say, we're inspired by your vision. Um, you know, we believe in you and we, we believe in your work. Um, so I would say it started with our ideas and it also started with other people that believed in us and, and took a leap of faith in us. That initial funding that we received enabled us to start building programming um, and infrastructure for the organization. So much of how we were able to um, uh, do the work that we ended up doing um, specifically policy change at the local level was uh, partnerships is one thing that comes to mind. I think that Denise has highlighted that in terms of partnerships with um, advisors, allies, champions at different institutions were so, so, so important. We never view that we could do this work alone at all um, from day one uh, in Creole Dreamers. You know, we, we also think about partnerships with uh, like peers, students, you know, a big part of Creole Dreamers is, um, is actually just the national network and community of students who we, we did the work for and who was doing the work also, you know, so it was all kind of this um, community effort. And then the other things I would say would be persistence and strategy. And I say that because dealing with issues around immigration and, and immigration status and the obstacles that are posed. Uh, there's so many changing uh, and moving pieces. You know, there could be one month where there is a new law that was passed or, you know, a, a court ruling that was passed and, and you have to understand the implications of what that would mean to, you know, our work with this in pre dreamers if it's to support folks through careers in health and science. And so then we, we often become the, the folks who share the information with institutions, you know, and, and try to have um, partner again with them to have them understand 
what this all means for for at the on the ground level when you know admissions committees are considering applications from from undocumented immigrant applicants you know what does it mean for financial aid what does it mean for licensing and, and the rest of of the pipeline which I, I want you both to pull your lenses back a little bit you've entered a profession and you went through academia to get there which if you look at statistics both the profession and academic medicine are racist, sexist, xenophobic, elitist. We tend to lack some virtues like humility and empathy. And one thing is advocating for the patient population. The other one is advocating to change the profession, change the profession on how we educate, how we admit students. Why do we throw talent away? Why is there not more diversity in what we're doing? Do you plan to continue your advocacy always for the patient, but also for change, not just in the way we, we educate and train doctors, but to actually create a system in this country that'll take care of people. I think to start off just with one-on-one -on -one change and then sort of thinking about broader change, when I'm thinking about one-on-one -on -one change, I was the first undocumented student to, um, and, and me and with a peer, um, to start at Mount Sinai. And the concept of an undocumented person in medical education was completely new and the administration, you know, didn't know what it meant to train someone with, with DACA. And, and then by extension, you know, the, the people that I really cared about um, are undocumented patients. And we had a lot of underserved undocumented patients in East Harlem and the surrounding neighborhood. And I was also part of a student run free clinic. One thing that I can think of was when the Trump administration had acted to rescind DACA, the first thing that I thought about was, okay, well, what's going to happen if ICE comes to our campus? What if ICE comes on the campus of our hospital? What is in place to protect not only me as a medical student, our workers, um, you know, within the Mount Sinai hospital system that have uh, DACA or, you know, even, even our undocumented patients. So I think what was really wonderful was it wasn't just about me, but it was about the entire community that touched base with the Mount Sinai hospital system. And so our, you know, I had many conversations with our leadership and, and one of the first things that happened was creating a security system um, within the campus housing that um, now had enhanced security and folks within the building had training on, you know, this is, this is what you do if ICE steps into a Mount Sinai facility. And there were letters that were being sent reminding patients of their rights and reminding doctors that their patients have rights. And I think that is really transformative because when you have more representation of medical students with you know, certain identities for me as an immigrant, then I think the benefits are not just at the individual level. I try to use my privilege as a medical student and extend that and, and help push our leadership to think about not just me and not just um, kind of the individual medical students, but everyone else. When I'm thinking of change in the individual level and, and in the medical profession, we have so much power and, and it extends, you know, it, it's, it's the power that we have in a clinic, in an office setting, in the hospital, but it's also the power, like you're saying, that we have that extends beyond um, sort of these formal spaces. And so then to take it to your next question, how, how are we changing policy? I think it goes on the individual level, you know, having those, that representation, you know, when possible, having our voice included in testimonies, um, both myself and new have given testimonies at the state and federal level, um, having our, the leaders of our institutions, whether the American Medical Association, myself in the emergency medicine field, having our, the, the top of our leadership be lobbying for policies that are progressive and not just beneficial to ourselves as physicians, but beneficial to our patients. So that's, that's some of the way that I'm conceptualizing change. 
New, how about you? I'm always one usually to really believe that um, people's hearts and minds can be changed some way, somehow. And so much of, in my experience and, and in our work with pre Dreamers, how that has been done is through authentic sharing of experiences and um, believing that if folks who, who, who don't know anybody who's undocumented, who didn't know what obstacles that pose and what internships the student didn't even have the opportunity to get, therefore being compared to other students, it's really not a level playing field, you know, and, and believing that if folks could understand the context and, and, and the obstacles that somehow you could, we could start to make some progress. While I do still believe that there are times and there are some situations and sometimes you, you sort of don't come to an agreement. I do think that in those moments, I feel like it just speaks to the importance of even doing the work to change culture even earlier, more upstream. So that we can even have the same conversation, you know, how this country views immigrants, right? And and because I think that is really at the core of so much that that comes from that. We had a clinic that we started back in the uh, late 1980s for undocumented uh, in my, in South Florida. We did it in churches. That's where we would have the clinics because we thought people would be feel safer coming there. But one of the interesting things is a story I'm going to tell you about a patient I had. I, I would see, I do primary care, but generally I'd go in there when you needed a GI or a liver consultation on patients. And this one young woman, about 17 years old, kept coming in with severe abdominal pain and change of bowel habits, all functional bowel, liverable bowel. But it wasn't until after about the fifth visit when she felt comfortable with me that she told me the story that this all started when she was raped one night. And then she was afraid to go to the police because she was documented, but her mother was not. And I called the uh, district attorney who I knew I'd gone to school with. I said, this is ridiculous. He goes, well, just call us. I said, yeah, but then you send the cop over and the cop has orders to arrest people that are undocumented. You know, I said, this, it's a convoluted system. So when you say you were afraid growing up, if that fear goes beyond just that, that fear goes you're afraid for you, you're afraid for your family, you're afraid to tell the truth. And that within itself is not very healthy. But you guys have resilience. Where do you think you got that resilience? This is an easy one. I mean, I, I think all the time about my family and my parents and everything that they've been through. I was so inspired by my mother, especially, she, she thought, you know, first in, in America, you need to learn English. And so she would take night classes and learn English. And so she learned English. And then she said, you know, in, in America, you can make something of yourself. And she then took nursing classes while, you know, working as a full-time mother, while or being a full-time mother and while uh, working multiple jobs. And she then became a nurse around the same time that I was finishing college. And I was so, so inspired that my, my mother could do all of that and carry all of that weight and not see her family for over 20 years. I think about not just the resiliency of my parents, I think about the resiliency of hardworking immigrants who work low wage jobs and the resiliency they have to go back to work, oftentimes at the, at the detriment of their own health. My goal was that if, if they can do all of that, I can, I can study, you know, like I can study. And so that, that felt like the easy part. Um, not that it, you know, it was hard, but I, they pushed me every day and the support that I had from them really pushed me and, and change for my community pushed me. My parents, like many other immigrants, um, wanted to follow the American dream and moved here for the promise of better opportunities and a better life for themselves and their family. I mean, I think what actually showed me was really seeing firsthand that they would be working seven days a week, leaving in the morning, not coming back till close to midnight. I remember conversations with my mom filled with 
kind of tears initially when she wasn't sure if she could do this. It was just all very new, but they, they did it, you know, and they, they continued and they persisted. And that alone showed me what resilience looked like. And uh, similar to Denise, I felt like I could go to school. This is, you know, I know how to do that. <laughs> I can be a good student. Um, and I really set my sights to, to that. And I'm lucky and fortunate that things have worked out along the way um, to be able to, to succeed academically. And that was how I was going to, to help, help my family. And I would just say that since then, I think it's extended to, I'm always constantly being inspired by my peers. My peers, role models around me, uh, speaking about, um, you know, when we think about how it is that I felt comfortable to go from a place of also fear uh, of being undocumented and not, and, and just fear of being detained and, and all the possible consequences, saying the words undocumented, unafraid, and um, showing up to protests publicly, to speaking in news media about my story. It, it really is all about me seeing others who have come before me, who have done it, and who, you know, stand very strong in, in, in believing that our experiences matter and that it, speaking up about the injustices that we face, that our communities have faced, is worth it. You know, that is how we, more people know about it. That is how um, we begin to then engage with the problem and then make, and then fix it, you know, and, and I think seeing that um, coming out actually um, lets you find a community and find support. And actually for me felt like saved my life. I felt safer coming out. Um, uh, that was the moment that I needed to, the thing that I needed to realize um, uh, to then continue on this, this, this journey in the, in the trajectory that I've been on. Well, your, your parents, and I haven't met either set of them, obviously did an incredible job because it wasn't just a matter of teaching you resilience by their actions and what they were doing, but they had to have a lot of support for both of you, number one, because the other thing that they actually obviously gave both of you is a lot of confidence. And that's not easy when you're carrying all the other baggage that you're carrying. If I can just quickly add something that I I, I don't want folks to sort of take away from, from this sort of discussion about resilience is that it's not, it's not about exceptionalism. Because I, I feel like there's a narrative that the media has grabbed onto for over a decade, right? The, the dreamer narratives, the, the narrative that um, undocumented young people came here through no fault of their own, that they are you know, um, victims of the actions of their parents and that they shouldn't be penalized. And, and so that sort of narrative creates this dynamic where, well, then who is to blame, right? It's, it's the folks that brought us here. It's the, you know, because I think that that creates these, um, you know, antagonistic relationship. And, and so I hope that our stories, at least, you know, how we framed it show that it's not about them versus us. It's it's about a unit and how do we, um, you know, how does our immigration landscape, our healthcare landscape, think about individuals as a unit, as a family, and keeping families together, people keeping them healthy and safe and educated. It's it's just so upsetting um, when we have this narrative of exceptionalism because I think it misses the whole picture as well. The problem is a series of greater issues. One of them being, as you had mentioned earlier, the culture of America. Why are we against those that make our country better? Why are we willing to throw away talent? If you guys hadn't done what you've done, our profession would be suffering even more. Remember your, your, your patients' advocates. You, you guys know that better than anybody else. And call out the doctors that aren't. What would you recommend that should be required courses to get into medical school? And particularly those that are not sciences. 
that's a that's a great question. I, I to start off with one thing that I is is such a big missing element is the history of, of medicine. Because I think when we don't understand history, then we don't understand how our current politics and policies came into place. We don't understand how our current curriculum is is set. And when we understand history, then we can create new curriculum that better reflects um, the realities and the histories of our patients and our communities. The other um, big element of this, like you already touched on, was the admissions um, practices, which is a big element in all of this. And another thing that I would love to see is much more um, individual narratives from patients who are uninsured. Um, I would say one big element that I noticed that was missing in my medical education was a lot of the um, anecdotes and, and testimonies that we received, for example, when we were learning about dialysis and we were learning about kidney disease, that those testimonies were from folks who are insured. And, and, you know, they kept saying statements like, oh, well, I just called my doctor and we did this and that. And I was like, you know, I grew up not, you know, not never seeing the same doctor more than once. I didn't even know that you could have a doctor that you call yours. You know, like that, that concept wasn't, you know, there for me. And so if we're learning um, how to practice medicine with, you know, mostly insured patients, um, then I don't think we truly learn how to um, serve underserved communities. We're required to improve the lives of everybody without prejudice. I think medical education, especially if you're receiving any public funds, has to be sh shown that they improve the lives of the most uh, vulnerable populations that they're taking care of. And this should not be a rotation. This should be ingrained in everything we do. I want you to send a message out to the country to the world, to medical students, and to doctors. I think that so much of what we, today's conversation is about identifying what, what it is that makes somebody able to believe that they can be an agent of change, you know, and I think that um, hopefully we've imparted ways in which we felt like we believe that and we come to believe that. Um, and that's what I would like folks to walk away with as well is to know that change can, can look in so many different ways. And again, daring to, to dream of what is possible within medical education for folks who are faculty members and institutions um, who are in leadership positions, who are program directors of residencies and fellowship training programs. I just think that doing what you can to be aware of the experiences of marginalized, you know, applicants who have marginalized backgrounds, it means that they have overcome so, so much. And, and really, again, understanding what, what that had meant for them from a personal level, from, you know, social level, and then academically. It's so funny, like this feeling, this like peace in my heart that said, undocumented people deserve the right to higher education and to healthcare. And it was like my mantra and it, and I felt it to my core and, and I wanted to scream it out loud sometimes. And it was that piece. It was that reminder that I said to myself when, when we would face challenges. Um, so I think on an, on an individual level to create change, you have to believe in something, right? Like what is that mantra of yours? What is the injustice that you see around you? And how do you hold on to that belief, even though you know you may be the only person in your school or in your institution that you know is seeing this disparity? And so the second thing there is, there is absolutely no way that um, I would have ever been part of so much advocacy without new and the entire pre health dreamers community. That is to say, and, and not just you know individual members, but the extraordinary community of allies at the medical school level, um, at ally organizations. So none of it is possible without that community. So once you find that mantra, find that community, you know, get plugged in. And if there's no community, 
I, there's someone out there who believes in that injustice and it's just about finding someone else. And I think once you find that community, you just like latch onto it <laughs> and you don't let it go. I think for the residency program level, you know, when we're talking about equity, I'm, I'm thinking about the part that I see be focused the most is on the recruitment side. You know, that there's a big emphasis on recruiting diverse applicants, diverse medical school students, and then diverse residency, a residency body. And for me, that is just, you know, the very start of it. You know, how, how do we re-envision our role as something different? Take the example of, you know, 20 Latinx applicants in the entire pool um, for say emergency medicine, what does it matter that they go to one program or the other, right? At the end of the day, there's only gonna be 20 more physicians who graduate at the end of residency. So I think the goal should not only be to recruit people to your program, but it should be to increase the supply as a whole, right? And that starts so much early on. That starts with investing in K through 12 education. That, that goes into diversity and pipeline work all along high school, college. By the time you make it to residency, I, uh, I, I, I don't think the goal should be just you know, increasing your numbers as an institution to make yourself look good, if that makes sense. Makes um, sense in the world. Once you're in residency, how do you invest in the success of those individuals? You know, you've done all this hard work to sell your program and, and now, now what? How do you then train your residents in an environment that is equitable? So it's also about focusing on every other step of that continuum. I did want to do a few, a few shout outs to some of the current programming of Free Health Dreamers. Um, there is a, uh, among the many things in advocacy and at the institutional level and at the legislative levels, state and some national that we do, partnered with local offices to actually draft bills and pass into policies and laws. And so, but the one I wanted to really uplift is um, a current program called the National Community Coalition, or NCC, and it's actually meant for um, folks at higher education institutions all across the country and join as change makers um, for folks who we would consider more champions at their local institutions who would want to join to plan trainings and, you know, raise awareness and uh, set goals for change at your institution. So all, that's just a little summary. And, and if you're at all interested in something like that, um, please contact Free Health Dreamers, um, our executive director, or go on our website. I think very well put, both Nu and, uh, and Denise. And I think, I hope everybody listened very carefully. But if we are really serious about health equity, then we have to deal with social and public policies, not health policies, because those are the ones that adversely affect it. And we as educators have to say, when we're talking about diversity, we better include socioeconomic diversity and documentation diversity. I, I'm assuming you all are residents now. Are you? Of the United States? We're not? both still undocumented. Really? So they make you do a residency without letting you be a resident? We'll get that residency one day. <laughs> Fantastic. You guys, thank you very much for your time. Thank you seriously from the bottom of my heart for what you're doing, for not just the undocumented uh, individuals in this country, but actually giving a heart to this country and doing what is right. Continue that in your careers. Save a bunch of lives. You have my full support and people listening, please contact them at least the organization, do what you can do. If you have two leaders like this, support their cause. Even if it's just marching with them, but support it, just be there. And with that, I think we're about done. So I'm gonna say hasta luego, or goodbye for those of you that are linguistically impaired. Thank you both to Neil and Denise for being on this uh, webinar, but most importantly for who you are and what you do. And by the way, next time you see your parents, tell them I said thank you. I will. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you so much, everybody. What a 
inspiring and awesome presentation. Um, that is uh, not just inspiring for our souls and our hearts, as, as uh, Joe just said, but inspires us to action. Um, so it, first thing, if people could come off mute for just a second or, um, or at least hit the, uh, the reaction button somewhere in here and give this group a round of, of much deserved applause. So if we could. Um, we have several questions. Uh, you will hear a voice coming out of the, out of the ether. That will be the person whose, whose name is Paul uh, asking the questions. Paul, do you have any questions for us as we move forward? And new, you can come on camera if you're if you're able, and come off um, uh, mute. Sure, we have several questions. The first is, do either of you have any patient stories you could share about working with an undocumented patient and how your own personal experiences helped you better empathize with care for that patient? And also, do you share the fact that you were undocumented with your coworkers? or patients. Uh, New or Denise? Um, I can I can share some of my experiences first. I've um, uh, definitely have had more than a handful of uh, patients who have been undocumented. And I remember quite early on actually um, in medical school when I was first in, encountering um, this and and was reflecting and reconciling with how to kind of, uh, with my being an undocumented um, uh, immigrant identity with, uh, as a medical trainee. And I remember uh, there were, um, there would be kids like in the pediatrics clinic at, at um, San Francisco General who would come in who were undocumented and, um, they would come in and I remember a particular patient who, um, whose family members were also, um, who were there, uh, also had questions about um, like school. <laughs> so it was also questions about school. They recently arrived, not really being sure how to even access different resources in addition to, to just receiving healthcare um, uh, in terms of their admission. And I think I, you know, all of that really resonated and, and, and um, kind of uh, reminded me to really uh, remember and lean on my own personal lived experiences as an undocumented person um, to really understand, oh yeah, like um, this is, these are the types of barriers and, and exactly how it plays out in terms of not knowing how to, how to, like what resources are even available, you know, how to um, uh, access resources and ask for help um, in addition to the language barriers that there are. Um, and it just allowed me to, or reminded me to advocate um, even further um, and in, in even more resourceful ways um, for those patients um, and for the patients um, since then who I, I've cared for. Thanks, New. The incredible power of story, right? Uh, not only the story that you just told, but the story that somebody can identify with you and you can identify with them. Denise, do you have um, a story for us also? Or a story? Yeah. Yeah, it can oh. be more than one. <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm in uh, emergency medicine and rotate through different um, uh, places throughout my intern and second year. And this was during my intern year. I was in December as COVID cases were on the rise and I was on the ICU. And I had had a couple of patients who had passed away and it was really hard and us doing everything we could possible to try to um, you know, reverse their disease course, but unfortunately passed away. and. I was with uh, a, a young uh, Latino male and he was um, on the brink of being intubated. And I remember 
um, one of the reasons it came up was because his, uh, he had mass limited health and for us, at least in the state of Massachusetts, mass limited means you don't have sort of the, the full scope of services and often folks who are undocumented are in that category. <clears throat> and so I remember, I mean, my interactions with him were influenced in two, two ways. One was, you know, I knew that his resources as an outpatient would be limited. Um, so my senior actually really, um, was wonderful in suggesting that we do a lot of, of the physical therapy and focus a lot of that within the hospital because we knew that as an outpatient and at the moment of discharge, you, you lose a lot of those services um, when, when you have limited health care. And so that, that, that was really wonderful for us to advocate that he get more or, or robust services within the hospital. And then two, um, I, I was scared for him and for him being intubated and sort of having a similar course as, as my other patients. And so, um, I, you know, I, I just remember sitting down with him and telling him to pronate <laughs> because, um, you know, it, it, we, we just hoped that that would improve his oxygen status. And so, I mean, thankfully he, he did well and, um, you know, it, it didn't really, I didn't share my immigration status then, but I felt like knowing some of the um, barriers he faced in the healthcare system, particularly around his insurance status, we, we tried to just optimize his care inpatient. Um, Rich or Joe, any reactions to these stories or follow-up questions? No, I just wanna say once again, Denise and New, you are two really impressive professionals. You are a great asset to our profession and to our country and to the world. Keep doing what you're doing. And if you need our help, call us. We're there. Rich, any follow-up from you? I, I'd just like to, to mirror what, uh, what Dr. Greer just said. Um, it's, it's, these are extraordinary stories and they're not isolated uh, in any way, as you well know, and uh, to, to, to celebrate uh, your success and willingness to organize uh, to the extent that you've been able to advance uh, the cause and provide the talents which you both so demonstrate easily uh, to caring for uh, the U.S. population is really spectacular. Uh, it's why the Vilcek Gold Award was invented. Uh, and on behalf of both of the foundations, I thank you once again uh, for this remarkable contribution. And I just want to take a, a moment to um, advise everyone who's still with us on this broadcast that uh, the nomination process for 2023 20, uh, uh, is now open and you can find uh, the mechanism for uh, nominating um, immigrants for their contributions to American healthcare on both the Vilcek and the Gold websites. Um, before we go to another question from the, from the audience, um, New and Denise, um, Joe said a couple of times in, in this setting and in the, uh, in the initial interview that um, we are here, we in our generation, all of us who are sort of older people um, will stand by ready to help you. If you were going to ask us as representatives of, the, of organized medicine in some ways, uh, 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 physicians who have plowed the field, what would you, what help would you ask for, for to Joe and Rich and uh, all the people that they represent behind them? Go ahead, Denise. Um, I, there are so many, and it, one, I appreciate just, you know, the, the invitation of support and it has truly been the support of individuals like yourself that we, um, 
have been able to open up doors and opportunities for folks in higher education. And I mean, one thing that I want to reiterate is the power of education within communities. Um, you know, for, for instance, myself being first generation, coming from a low income background, I, I hope that my success in, in education and hopefully when I get my first um, adult job in, in, in medicine, you know, have the ability to support my parents financially, have the ability um, to provide them stability that they've never had uh, in, in, in their life. And so um, I think education transforms individuals, but whole communities. And I hope that people can carry that to heart. Um, and in, in doing so, so I would encourage the support of, and continue support of diversity in higher education and in medicine. And that comes with through avenues that is, um, you know, that are already happening. But for example, um, changing policies such as our um, standardized test taking, um, our federal financial support, um, which at this moment is limited to uh, green card holders and U.S. citizens. But how how do you increase funding, whether through institutional means through um, uh, private sources to increase the number of uh, immigrants and, and diverse applicants to um, the health professions. Two, I would ask, you know, every medical school and um, sort of medical organization has a lobby arm, um, you know, spending hundreds of thousands of dollars in lobbying. And uh, so I would encourage lobbying not only at the federal level for immigration reform um, or other policies like healthcare um, uh, in, in increasing um, folks who are eligible for healthcare. But also at the state level, you know, there's, there's amazing measures at the state level happening right now. For example, in Massachusetts, we had a driver's license bill that um, passed and was up for vote. And for for me, having the ability to drive has been important as, as you know, I think anyone can empathize from getting to your doctor's appointment to getting to work. And um, I think there's so many state level measures that are happening and that we can have a voice. Because I feel like sometimes it, it seems so daunting to think about um, you know, change at the federal level, but there's so so many amazing things happening at the city and, and the local level that I would just encourage continued civic engagement. New, how can we amplify your voice? Um, well, I was actually, you know, thinking um, as Denise was sharing the uh, policy kind of solutions and ways to support and um, institutional levels, I think that uh, we should also remember the individual levels um, and whether or not folks who are, are listening and are joining, um, you are involved in, in decision making at your institution um, in a formal way or an informal way. Um, you know, there are plenty of ways to support uh, immigrant trainees, immigrant communities. Um, you know, if you are sitting on some selection committee at your institution, there's a huge impact that you can have in terms of even asking tomorrow or this next cycle, you know, are there undocumented applicants to, to your institution? What's happening? How, how are they being screened? How are they being considered? Um, you know, uh, there, that's one example. Um, there's individual mentorship um, that opportunities that can be created. You know, it may take a little bit of, of um, being resourceful and asking why and how um, that's outside of the box that, that may be uh, the, the default box. You know, so in other words, um, programs that are available and opportunities are available. Are they open to undocumented students? If they're not, why not? And how can that change? And if there are no current programs, can can something be created 
So, and I say all this because in, in my own journey and the journeys of many of my peers now who are documented, um, I just have so much appreciation, admiration, and and um, um, just being feeling gratitude for f mentors, folks along the way, other physicians who um, who wanted to not give up on us, and I think that that goes such a long way um, to have um, um, folks who who are champions of this cause and want to. Um, find ways to to further it. Great, thank you. And oh, go if, ahead, please, Denise. Go ahead. If I can just mention, I know the link was in the chat, but um, you know, we also welcome any support and um, you know, one donation to our organization, PrealDreamers.org, and two, we do have a um, national coalition where we work with organizations to increase their capacity and support for undocumented um, uh, medical students, residents, um, college students. So that is on our website. It's also preeldreamers.org uh, forward slash NCC uh, if folks wanted to learn more. Great. Well, do we have another question from the participants? Yes. Because DACA will more than likely disappear, how can and how should medical school and educational institutions advocate for incoming medical students and residents who don't have work authorization? And is there a plan for advocacy on a national level around moving through residency without work authorization? Go ahead, New. Um. I think this is a very good question um, and very um, uh, well informed in terms of um, changes at the national level, federal level around DACA. And I think that um, at the end of the day, uh, you know, what we've already been seeing um, in the past many years since DACA has been around, and um, more and more institutions have been accepting undocumented students, uh, mostly with DACA is that that's allowed, that's what, that's what has driven the change, you know, to show that, um, I mean, what we're all here to talk about, which is um, uh, why undocumented uh, immigrants can and should also be able to, to go through medical education. Um, and I think that can, the, the, the summary line is that institutions should, should continue um, accepting more and more um, undocumented students, you know, and I think that the, the piece around work authorization um, specifically um, is, is a, is a, um, is one challenge that would come up, you know, it's not a, there's no legal barrier to accepting folks, but um, we would have to figure out the, the work authorization piece. Um, uh, and, but, you know, I have hope that there are ways um, that that can be worked out. Um, there are ways that undocumented student, uh, immigrants in general can work as consultants, for example. And I, you know, my, on the spot right now, I don't quite know that that has, that uh, those avenues have been fully explored given that there has been DACA for the past 10 years. Um, but that would be one such um, idea that's come up. Um, I don't know if Denise has anything to add. Denise? Yeah, so I, um, this sort of reminds me of being in college and, um, you know, hearing counselors advise me against going into medicine because, you know, they're like, how, how are you going to pay for it? There's no way to become licensed. And, you know, I've never heard of anyone doing it. And um, when I first met New about a year later, we actually heard of someone who had finished their training um, and, and their entire medical education. And speaking to her, you know, she, she didn't know how she was going to, you know, practice. And then, you know, DACA was announced shortly after, and then she was able to resume her training and is now currently an attending physician. And so, um, you know, we, we all the time have to 
make plans with limited information. And so I just encourage um, admissions committee to make the leap of faith with us and know that, you know, th there is often no set plan for how, you know, we are, um, you know, going to practice medicine if DACA goes away. But if, if you take the leap of faith with us, I think that will then um, be encouraging both um, to individual people, but to, um, I think our policymakers that, that you, you show the need for a legislative solution. You say, you know, here we have over 300 individuals without DACA in medical schools. There is no way that we can not allow them to practice medicine, right? That puts the pressure back onto our policymakers um, and, and encourages them to make solutions that are um, consistent with the realities of our communities. But if we then stop accepting medical um, applicants who don't have DACA, then you know it, it sort of it it sort of defeats the purpose and uh, um, sort of makes the case even harder for our policymakers. So um, there there was a saying that I heard once that. You know, you build the train tracks, you don't know when the train is coming, but you build them anyways. And, and I've lived by that motto. Um, and, and I hope that you can too. That's great. Uh, Joe, as a, as a dean and a, as a recognized genius by the MacArthur Foundation, do you have any insights on, on this from the other end, from the, uh, the policy, the, the medical school and et cetera, that how, um, given the question. From the policy from a medical school is don't purely look at numbers. I have to increase Hispanic students. Because I remember my daughter who was a Hispanic and, and a regular merit scholar. When she was a junior, she was recruited by some very large institutions, one near San Francisco, the other one in Nashville. And they flew her out there. And I asked a fellow board member that I knew was a trustee at the institution in California, I said, are you recruiting my daughter for football? For God's sake, she's a junior in high school. Then you're flying her out to the school. He says, no, 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 no. We're trying to increase our minority status. And I looked at him. I said, you know what my daughter's minority status is? She has two parents with graduate degrees, and she's been to private school her whole life. I don't think that that's necessarily the one. You want to recruit and give a scholarship to if I can afford to pay for it. I regretted saying that later on because I had to pay for it. But the, uh, <laughs> But we do have to look at socioeconomics and we do have to seriously bring in students that normally wouldn't think about it. And we have to start very young, as you said, educating the communities, because we need not only to educate the kids, but their parents for the importance of getting a professional degree. Denise, in many ways, you become the first one in your family, like my father was, to earn generational wealth. I mean, hopefully you'll be like Bill Gates. But at the very worst, you're going to pay your kids college and you're going to have a home and you're going to have a future and you leave things for your children. That's what this country is about, giving people these opportunities. And I think nobody else but you two could simplify that more and the determination you have. And actually, I also want to thank you so much for your, your empathy and your humility. I mean, you, you two are to be celebrated. And it's just an honor to say that I've gotten to meet you. Not in person, but that'll come, okay? Rich, any insights on from your end on this question? No, it's uh, it, it's out, it's outside of our range of influence wandering into the policy zone. Uh, so I don't have I don't have anything to add, Tim. Thank you. Uh, Paul, any other questions? In a decade, we will be short an estimated 150,000 doctors and perhaps 300,000 nurses. What is happening on the policy front to change policy so that dreamers and immigrants of all sorts can enter the health profession? I think the first policies we need to change are within our institutions. And that's the admissions policies. Then that's also going to be for us to influence and change pre-med requirements. But I think that has to come institutionally, and this is maybe something that double AMC can start addressing. Because we are trying to address the diversity issues. We just got to do it right. 
Yeah, and they yeah. and that they're osteopathic equivalents. Uh, right. Um, uh, Denise or New, any thoughts about this question? Yeah, I mean, I I can sort of think of one, um, a couple of things at the federal level, but I wholeheartedly agree with Joe about having um, sort of the start of this, and 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 has been ongoing is is changing sort of admissions policies and, and practices and institutional level first, and because we 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 all um, sit or or have sit on um, admissions committees or or places where we determine. Um, you know, who is in our institution. Um, so on, on, in addition to the DREAM Act, um, the, the, so the, the DREAM Act has been introduced many times over the last decade. And um, what you may have noticed in this last iteration of the DREAM Act is that it um, was more inclusive, meaning, um, you know, sometimes there can be really strict education requirements. Um, you know, uh, this version of the Dream Act, I think, had um, would have been would have benefited the most amount of um, individuals. So, um, I think that that is one way is envisioning policies that are more inclusive. Um, two is a, a huge issue in. Um, going into higher education is paying for it. And unfortunately, undocumented folks are not eligible for any federal financial aid, which is a, a main mechanism that people um, pay for um, medical school and other programs. And so I know there, there has been some proposals to increase um, or to allow federal dollars to um, go to individuals who are either DACA recipients, TPS. Um, I, I figure all of the nuances of it, but there there have been some policies thrown around. Um, I do think though, um, uh, the solution is in finding private partnerships with private lenders, um, private philanthropic sources to increase funding opportunities for undocumented um, individuals. Um, I, I've just seen the most success in, in that happening, um, whether it's, uh, you know, um, for example, when I first started at Mount Sinai, the committee or, or the, the policy was that you couldn't have undocumented applicants um, apply for need-based financial aid. And so, um, you know, the individuals um, in the financial aid committee reviewed my application. And then um, after sort of understanding my situation and my circumstances, then um, addended their policy to now include um, individuals like myself in eligibility for financial aid and, um, or at least the private sources of financial aid. So I, I think those type of institutional changes um, it, Many of them combined will change the landscape. New, any anything to add? New. Okay. Not uh, We are. I think we're one minute away. Do we have a quick question, Paul, or um, is it time? Uh, I can ask one more. You talked about your fears and your inspirations. What is it that worries you now as you begin your career as physician and? What is it that inspires you now? All right, why don't we start with New on this one, which I absolutely did not give him enough time to think about this. And that's why I'm, <laughs> him, so I'm giving him time to think about it. Uh, what do you fear and what inspires you? Um, uh, I think, I think I'm actually, um, uh, on most days, very, very grateful um, to be at the stage in which I am now. And so I often don't think that I have an active fear around career and, and um, being undocumented with DACA. I think that um, if we were to look forward to the future, that, that that is a concern somewhere in the back of my mind of if DACA were to um, to go away and there are no other alternative solutions or legislative policies that are, are, are passed. And I think uh, they'll, you know, cross that bridge um, in terms of 
work authorization and continue to practice um, as a physician and, and um, ensuring that I can do that. Um, what inspires me um, are, uh, hmm, what inspires me currently? Well, on this, currently it's just my family. Uh, I don't know if that's, you know, it's, it is currently in my, my, uh, my mind where I am looking forward to be able to um, continue to continue to care for them and take care of them um, as I start sort of the next stage in my journey in my, in my career, so. Thank you, and uh, Denise? Um, I, I think one thing I'm concerned about is, is burnout. Um, I, I know that's really high in our profession and in the field of emergency medicine. And I know that doing things that feed my soul help with burnout and um, having a foot in the clinical practice and a foot in the advocacy space really feeds my soul. So I, I hope to continue combining those two to have a long career. Um, and uh, two, what inspires me is, um, I think seeing for me, at this moment is seeing young folks who are, um, you know, just, I, I see myself in them from 10 years ago and, and just so excited for their future and for their potential. So um, that's what I'm really excited about right now. What a, a, a wonderful conversation that I would love to stretch on much longer than this, um, uh, but we have promised you. And for those of you who don't know, new is actually in Thailand um, at three o'clock in the morning or four o'clock in the morning <laughs> let them get some much needed sleep. I would love to thank you, Denise um, and Nu, for the conversation that you had, for the journey that you've begun and the journey you're continuing. I'd also like to thank Joe for what a wonderful moderator and, um, and the work that he's done all the way along uh, that hewed a little bit of a path that you all are, are treading. And uh, Rich Levin, uh, Dr. Rich Levin and Dr. Jan Vilcek, um, for the recognition, we need things to celebrate. We need things to inspire. And this has been really inspiring. I, and I'll leave you with this. You know, the old story of Pandora's box, everybody knows, but they leave off one really important part. Pandora gets married, Zeus decides he's gonna trick her, he knows she's curious, gives her a jar that says, don't open this. And of course she opens it and all the ills of humanity come flying out, hatred, war, violence. Um, Fox everything. News. With Fox News. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and she is, she is completely despairing and weeping at what she has done. And then there's a little buzz in the jar that she hears. And there's one more spirit that's just trapped in there and she lets the, the, takes the lid off again. It's the spirit of hope is the last one. So amidst what's all going on in our world, that spirit of hope is amongst us. That spirit of hope is embodied by the two of you, the three of you, the four of you actually, uh, that's here. Let's all grab onto that hope and I'll shift metaphors. And, and the spark that Joe and Denise and Nu and uh, Rich and Jan have sparked. Um, let's, let's get that fire going. Let's get it going bright on a hilltop and say, there is something here we're celebrating and we're going to go towards that fire because that's what's going to, that's what's going to ultimately save us. I thank you all. Um, and this has been wonderful. Um, and this is it, Nui. It's time for you to go to bed, and uh, and the rest of us. Actually, Nui, it's time for you to wake up. <laughs> True. <laughs> it's, it's time, and it's time for us to um, to take this inspiration and, like Denise and Nui did, act on it. Let's take the next step, and the next step, and the next step. Thank you very much. Goodbye.